Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special event. I'm Lisa Levinson with In Defense of Animals. I'm here with Marley Narrow, host of Vegan Nation. We are delighted to host Northern Vegans Raising Vegan Dogs and Cats panel discussion today. So Northern Vegans, founded in 2006, is located in the beautiful Upper Peninsula of Michigan. They have donated dozens and dozens of vegan-related media to local UP libraries throughout the years. In October of 2019, Northern Vegans hosted the Free the Animals Spectacular Vegan Carnival with singing, dancing, magic, juggling, comedy, balloon artistry, clowns, and yummy vegan pizza and desserts. No live animals were exploited and all of the food was vegan. Here are some great photos of this memorable event. Let's see. Okay. Great. So we're going to share a couple of photos of this event. So here's uh, one of the posters from the event, from the carnival. Another great poster so you can get a sense of what was going on there. Some pictures, all kinds of people attended. A few more photos, looks like fun. I wish I was there. <laughs> and one more photo of this beautiful tiger, <laughs> handsome tiger. So just wanted to share those images with you for a couple moments. Northern Vegans also hosted many educational events, including a film screening of Cowspiracy with 220 people attending. Their outreach events attract pre-vegans to learn more about veganism, but this webinar is for vegans who want to transition their companion animals to a vegan diet. Northern Vegans had regular monthly vegan restaurant meetups and potlucks, but all that changed with the pandemic in 2020. They hope to resume these events in the near future, but meanwhile, they're getting together for monthly hikes. You can sign up for their monthly emails at northernvegans.com and follow them on Facebook. During the webinar today, please reserve your questions for after the panel discussion. Following the Q&A, we've got several free giveaways for lucky winners. This webinar is being recorded. Tomorrow, you will receive a Zoom replay link by email that will be active for one week. We'll also post a replay on Northern Vegans YouTube channel, where you can watch and share it going forward. Now, Marlene will introduce our wonderful panelists. Welcome, everyone, and thank you. And a big welcome to our panelists. Dr. Almighty May in Los Angeles, Matthew Sakura in Colorado, Diana Lavader Dunetz in Florida, Dr. Susan Craig in California. Now each of them will tell us a little bit about themselves. Dr. May. Thank you, Marlene. It's great to be here. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Armighty May. I'm a practicing vegan veterinarian in Los Angeles. I have a house call practice for dogs and cats. I've been doing veterinary medicine now for over 15 years. I incorporate a combination of conventional medicine, Chinese herbs, acupuncture, homeopathy, laser treatments, essential oils, and other modalities as indicated for each patient that I treat. I also recommend a wholesome plant-based nutrition when indicated, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I've been a vegan now for 21 years. I've been involved in vegan activism for just as long, and I have a nonprofit group that I started called the Veterinary Association for the Protection of Animals, or VAPA, and we bring awareness to the plight of animals encourage people to adopt a vegan diet through documentary screenings and catered vegan dinner events. So it's great to be here and look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. May. Diana. Hey, everyone. It's really great to be here and to talk about this really important topic and a topic that's really misunderstood by a lot of people, including uh, vegans. 
And a little bit about myself, I have a master's degree in animal science and I've been a canine nutritionist for over a decade. I've been vegetarian since 2009 um, and, and vegan since 2017. And my journey into both canine nutrition and veganism started when I adopted my canine soulmate Chase back in 2002. And Chase taught me about canine nutrition. He had a lot of different um, conditions when he came to me, but he even more importantly taught me about having compassion for all animals and about the suffering that all animals endure. Um, that is my current baby Moo, my vegan boy. That's a before and after. Um, yeah, so at any rate, um, it was really when I became vegan in 2017 that my life transformed. Um, for me, vegetarianism was the pathway to that. But when, when I became vegan, I realized that I could no longer formulate diets for dogs that contained any animal ingredients. It just was totally against everything I believed in. Um, at the same time, I obviously wasn't going to harm any any dogs by inappropriate nutrition. And I was actually ready to walk away from my business if it meant doing that. But um, fortunately, I didn't do that. I decided to do a lot of research. And what I came up with amazed me. Not only can dogs thrive on well-balanced vegan diets, plant-based diets, but it's likely the high meat diets that so many people are feeding today that are a huge um, causative factor in all of these skyrocketing cases of canine chronic disease, including cancer. So I'm really excited to be here and to talk about, um, you know, both the health and the welfare aspects of that. And I'm also super excited because right now I'm writing a brand new book on plant-based dog nutrition um, with Dr. Gene Dodds. And I hope it'll be out early next year. I hope you guys all check it out because it's really gonna be packed with science and it's going to be change the way people think about feeding their dogs. So if you want to learn more about me, just uh, visit plantpowereddog.com. Thank you, Diana. And Matthew? Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, having me. It's, it's an honor to be amongst so many uh, wonderful people here. Um, I, I started going down the vegan. Uh, I started, I watched Forks Over Knives, and that was just a wake up call. Uh, my family had a disease and running in the family. And I felt like I was next. And I, what I learned from forks over knives just blew me away. So thankfully, um, social media kind of got me started and I was exposed to some kind of, um, dairy image. And I, I just, I simply couldn't believe what I uh, saw in the, the dairy. And so then we went vegan. And I do remember there was a point in time where, uh, someone had said on social media that dogs could be vegan. And I, I laughed, I, you know, uh, it seems like, you know, I just like that. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. And now my dogs have been vegan for going on eight or nine years now and thriving better than ever. So uh, that's my story. It started with health. I, I definitely, that allowed me to open the door in my mind for the ethics. And since then, I've tried to just share um, my experiences and test, testify to what the positive changes in my life. And uh, my wife and I still hold today that it's our single best decision we've ever made in our lives was to go vegan. Thank you, Matthew. Susan? Good day, everyone from all over the world. It's great to be here. Um, I, first of all, I might, my doctorate is in educational leadership and I'm a university um, faculty. I work with teachers, so I'm not a veterinarian or a physician. I am a longtime vegan over 30 years as a dietary vegan, although it took me a while to uh, make, and that was for moral reasons, that my reason for going vegan was to not participate in violence towards any beings. Um, it took me a while to make a full connection. Um, I had a cat and I, it didn't occur to me to feed my cat a vegan diet, and I did not even know if there was such a thing. So um, my first cat didn't live all that long. He lived 13 years, and I think he would have lived a lot longer had he been vegan. Um, I then had um, subsequent cats and began feeding them the very first formula of evolution, and that was about... Um, 
19, 20 years ago and had some inconsistency with having my cats on a vegan diet that I'll go more into in the Q&A. Um, my cats, so I started with cats and my cats have been fully vegan for um, about six years. And my dogs, I began uh, bringing in some rescued dogs. I began dog becoming a dog mom about five and a half years ago. And my dogs, I have six dogs. They've all been vegan since being with me. Um, so I have six dogs and four cats, all are fully vegan. And I'm uh, here to share my experiences as an animal mom who's um, been able to successfully have all my animals be vegan and be super healthy. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, panelists. Now we'll start the Q&A. Can you discuss the importance of adopting animals, not shopping for them, not buying from breeders, and how adopting is a vegan ethic? Matthew? Yeah, um, so um, unfortunately and unfortunately, I started out my, my, my adult life um, in the dog snob mentality of thinking I had to kind of have a certain kind of dog and a certain kind of dog to find who I was. And I was reflecting on this because it, it has been a, a, a big kind of punch in the gut ever since going vegan, realizing that um, my dog Happy uh, up here, um, we, we did get from a breeder and this was pre-vegan. And, um, but the, the more I thought about it as a kid, when you see a dog, like you're not like defined on what a dog is supposed to look like or how it is or whatever. And so, but then like through enough media and like stuff, you, you think you have to have a certain kind of dog. So I kind of just grew up thinking, oh, you know, I have to have this kind of dog. Um, so after, after going vegan, we started visiting um, dog shelters. And that was a wake up call beyond uh, almost anything. I mean, it's almost like, you know, in some ways like a slaughterhouse in a, a way because you see these animals, these beautiful beings kind of just uh, not necessarily neglected depending on the, you know, but they're just not loved like you would wanna love them. And so when you start to just add two and two and realize that like every time that you uh, don't adopt and you shop, um, that puts away a, a dog in, in a situation that doesn't have to be. And so um, we started visiting a dog shelter and just like getting closer and closer to these dogs and just realizing, wow, this is the way to go. And this is the right way all along. My wife still to this day says, you know, I told you from day one, we need to adopt. And so uh, we got, we got our second dog. Um, we rescued our second dog scooter and, and it's um, just amazing what, um, what love that all dogs can give, no matter who. So I do believe it is our obligation as people who care about animals to stop the, the uh, commodity, making them commodities and like having people, um, you know, end up, the, the system just creates too many victims and that our part, what we can do is definitely adopt instead of shop. And that was a big learning experience for me. Thank you, Matthew. The act of feeding our companion animals, other dead animals, compromises our vegan values. Please elaborate on this. Approximately how many animals are killed for the pet food industry? Dr. May? Thank you, Marlene. There are about 163 million dogs and cats living in the United States. And if they were their own country, they would actually be the fifth largest meat eating country on the planet. That's a really alarming statistic, especially considering that the, the US has, a, the human population of the US already is consuming vast amounts of animal products. So uh, I don't have a specific number of animals uh, to give you of how many are, are sacrificed for the purpose of feeding other animals but it, it is a significant amount. So I, I definitely uh, think it's important to educate people about the benefits of plant-based diets for the planet, for compassion to animals, and also for the health benefits, which we'll get into more. Thank you, Dr. Matt. What commercial <clears throat> vegan pet food brands do any one of you recommend? Diana, 
what do you feed? What do you use for dog food? Well, that's putting me on the spot a little bit because um, it, first of all, my guy Mu, who you showed, is really picky. So I have to go by his tastes and what he has accepted and not accepted. Obviously, um, being a canine nutritionist, I'd like to cook for him most of the time. But, you know, and also things in the industry change so often. Um, but I will tell you this, I look for certain things. Um, I look for things like non-GMO ingredients. I look for organic if we can do that. And I look for um, quality ingredients. And, you know, obviously no artificial colors and things like that. Right now, Moo is loving, uh, when we give him uh, commercial food, he's loving the Evolution organic uh, canned food. So when he does eat commercial, he likes it and it likes him and it's organic. So that's, <laughs> that's what we're doing right now. Thank you. Susan, what do you use for dog and cat food? So I have, as I mentioned, I have six dogs and four cats. Um, I prepare their treats, but I don't make all of their food. My dogs eat a combination of Evolution, the organic, which is the ultra life. They have three different types of uh, kibble and I feed them the ultra life. I also feed them a brand called Wild Earth and also uh, Bee Dog. And that's what my, my dogs eat primarily uh, evolution with some Wild Earth. I feed them a little bit of V-Dog and I also keep the V-Dog around. I make bags of V-Dog to give to um, homeless people who have animals. The evolution by weight is about um, twice the cost of Wild Earth and V-Dog where I live in California. Um, my cats are, I have found cats to be pickier eaters and I have found universally cats love Ami Cat which is made in Italy is um, quite expensive and hard to get because of the shipping here in the United States. If you're living close to Italy, I'm sure it's easier to get. Um, I feed them about half Ami Cat and about a quarter of the Evolution Organic and a little bit of the Wild Earth for flavoring because they love it, although it's not um, a dog food. Um, another thing that I do is I give them, depending on where you live, I have um, my own spring water, which I filter and they, so they get spring water that's filtered. Um, I don't, I, I, tap water is not a good idea to feed to animals. So spring or distilled water. And I also will hydrate their kibble. Um, at least some of the time when I feed them and I use nutritional yeast and some other um, flavorings on top. Thank you, Thank Susan. You. Thank you, Susan. Matthew? Yeah, we, we, I definitely, I go back and forth between which company because I want to give all my money to these vegan pet companies. We're big fans of V-Dog. That's what we started our dog on was V-Dog. Then um, we, 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 did, we did Evolution and we loved that. I mean, Happy, Happy and Scooter, they loved them all. And then um, we had this friend that had these German Shepherds and, and she was a wonderful vegan. She could not get her dogs healthy on um, dog food. And, she, and so finally she was able to try a brand and it was Wild Earth and they thrived off that. So for some reason, uh, V-Dog and the other ones weren't working for her dog. So we're like, oh, we'll try Wild Earth. And so now we do Wild Earth. So. I actually end up um, usually end up every two weeks, I'll, I'll switch between V Dog and um, Wild Earth. Um, that said, our dogs primarily eat what we eat because um, we eat a lot of food that, that we just end up making for um, the dogs too a lot of beans, rice, potatoes. Um, obviously, we try to limit the amount of oil and uh, process, you know, we don't do sugar or anything like that. So uh, the dogs end up getting meals with us. So usually they don't eat as much food as we would think because we just end up cooking for, I guess, all six of us now, including the two kids and, and the dogs. Thank I you. would recommend um, sweet, sweet potatoes. Um, they, they love sweet potatoes. 
And and Marlene, if I can just jump in and say, I think what kind of picking up on what um, Matthew was saying that all dogs respond differently to different foods. So it's really important that you kind of experiment um, and see what works best for your dog. See, you know, like I said, my dog's super picky and really won't even eat any of the kibbles, um, even though they're super high quality. So, you know, see what they like and see what agrees the best with them, um, you know, and then, and, and it's often good sometimes to rotate too every once in a while so that you can be sure that they're getting a variety of different types of nutrients that are in some of these different brands. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Matthew. Can you please discuss supplementation for both dogs and cats? Are these supplements readily available in the commercial pet foods we just mentioned? What supplements do dogs and cats need when being raised on a vegan diet? Dr. May? Thank you, Marlene. So if one is raising a dog or a cat on a nutritionally complete vegan diet that is already completely balanced, there's not any need for supplementation. I'm gonna just show a few sample brands that have vegan formulas. Halo, vegan formula, completely balanced and complete for dogs. Natural Balance, vegetarian formula. Nature's Recipe also has a vegetarian vegan formula. Evolution, which was mentioned earlier. V-Dog, Benevo and Avederm, Gather, there, there are quite a few for dogs actually. And so all of these have the full range of nutrients that dogs require to be healthy. And for cats, they're fewer in number, but there, there are still Almicat, Benevo, and Evolution that are nutritionally and complete and balanced for, dog, for cats. Uh, now, if someone is gonna home cook, I recommend this book by Dr. Richard Pitcairn. The, the fourth edition of the complete guide to natural health for dogs and cats that has recipes you can make at home. And if that's the case, you do wanna add in a supplement, which you can order from compassioncircle.com. And there are specific supplements for cats, kittens, puppies, and adult dogs, depending on what life stage they're in, that can be added into the recipe that's made to make it a, a nutritionally complete and balanced meal. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. And what are the differences between Wild Earth, V-Dog, Evolution Dog and Cat Food, and Ami Cat Food? And are there any others that you recommend? Dr. May? Thank you. There are some differences in the ingredients. Uh, they're all balanced and complete according to the American Association of Feed Control Officials, giving their stamp of approval that they've met the minimum requirements for needed nutrients. But there, were, there are some dogs who are pickier about certain foods. So it's important to try different options if they're not taking to the first food that's tried. Just like as we vegan humans may not enjoy all brands of almond milk or soy milk, we have to try different brands sometimes before we find one that agrees with us or that we find delicious to drink. And same with other vegan food items that you know we consume. So dogs also have their individual tastes and preferences. So it's important to be patient and transition them gradually to help minimize any upset GI symptoms such as vomiting or diarrhea if the swift change is made without a, enough of a, a transition for animals who are more predisposed to that. There can be some, some loose stool or uh, inappetence sometimes, but uh, definitely gradually over the course of one to two weeks, ideally transitioning them if they're accustomed to a meat-based diet can help them transition and adding in nutritional yeast flakes when they're not as apt to eat it without that, which is actually healthier too, because it has the B vitamins and it has a great cheesy flavor. So uh, there are a lot of options for them, but I think it, it is an individual case by case basis, how well a certain dog will respond to a particular formula. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. We all first and foremost want to feed our dogs the healthiest diet possible. What are some of the reasons that a plant-based diet is actually healthier than a meat-based one for dogs? Diana? Yeah, that's the really kind of wonderful part about all of this is we're doing it 
you know, because we don't want to harm other animals, but it's absolutely a thousand percent the healthiest track for our canine companions, assuming that we're giving them a complete and balanced diet. And that goes with whatever type of diet you're feeding. They have to have all of their nutrients. But, you know, in this book that I'm writing now, one of the things that we're uh, writing about and researching is the correlation between um, meat-based you know, animal ingredients in general, be it poultry, um, uh, you know, uh, beef, dairy, and all kinds of chronic diseases, um, including cancer. And, you know, for example, there's, there's even, there's something called bovine leukemia virus. And they now suspect that this is a zoonotic um, blood virus, leukemia, that's actually in people's DNA who eat foods that of cows that have this virus. And you might say, well, that can't be that many cows that can't get into the system. Actually, it's a massive major part of the food system. Um, almost all cows have it. And unless they actually have leukemia, they, if they only have it in their blood, they're still a part of the food system. And it's actually been found to be in the DNA of cells of 38% of people who are tested actually have this bovine leukemia in their cells. So, you know, you might think, well, I'm feeding a fresh food diet. I'm not feeding, you know, pet food. Meat and poultry and dairy and fish are contaminated with all kinds of environmental pollutants, with viruses, um, you know, PCBs, dioxins. Um, you know, I'm sure Dr. May can go on and on about this as well. So the lower down on the food chain that you eat, the less toxins have bioaccumulated. Toxins bioaccumulate up the food channel with, channel with every animal that then eats the animal below it. By the time you get to the top of the food chain, you are eating all of these toxins that have started in the soil and bioaccumulated up and are in the fatty tissues of the animals that you're eating. So the lower down on the food chain that you eat, the healthier that you're eating. And I'm just talking about fresh foods. I'm not even talking about the meat-based pet foods that are the absolute worst of all of this. And, and you know, and Dr. May might want to address that too. Um, sure, absolutely. Bioaccumulated toxins are a huge concern in meat foods. Any meat, even if it's organic, is going to have persistent organic pollutants by virtue of bioaccumulation up the food chain. And in, in addition to PCBs and dioxins, we have arsenic found in most chicken, mercury found in a lot of the seafood products, and any number of, of other carcinogenic chemicals that concentrate as they go up the food chain. So inherently, plant-based diets are cleaner, healthier, lower in toxins. And we know that one of the cornerstones of health is minimizing toxin exposure. When we consider that cancer is an epidemic for dogs and uh, very high for cats as well, 50% of dogs and 40% of cats suffer from cancer these days, it makes sense to reduce their toxin exposure through minimizing the, the food toxins they're eating. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Diana. What well, you know, and Marlene, I just want to say very quickly too, I find it interesting when, if a dog, heaven forbid, does get cancer and the prevailing um, trend these days seems to be feed them more meat, feed them more meat, feed them more meat. And sadly, meat is riddled with um, carcinogenic ingredients and yet we're feeding it in the hopes of getting rid of cancer. We're literally feeding cancer to stop cancer. So we might want to think about that, you know, and, and it's not just prevention, but once a dog actually has cancer, what are you doing about it? Thank you, Diana. What about homemade recipes for our cats and dogs? Any ingredients that cats or dogs must avoid? First, we'll hear from Diana about dogs and then Susan about cats. Diana? Sure, thanks. Well, obviously we want to avoid any ingredient that's toxic. <laughs> so the best thing for people to do is to look that up. You can go to, you know, the um, ASPCA's website, um, uh, you know, the Pet Poison Helpline. You can look up all of these toxic foods. Obviously we don't want to feed them onions, um, nutmeg, macadamia nuts, chocolate, alcohol, 
um, unbaked yeast, all of these things, but you really need to look it up. Grapes and raisins, all of these things are toxic. And, but what we do wanna do is feed them healthy, fresh, whole plant-based foods that are dog friendly. Um, and that's really, you know, the best way to get the nutrients. However, I do want to step back and say that all homemade diets need to be supplemented. Unfortunately, I look on the Facebook groups too often and I read about what people are feeding and they have the best intentions, but you can tell that they're not nutritionally balanced. Um, we talked about before veggie dog from Compassion Circle. If you are going to make your own recipes, you have to include things like that. And obviously what I do is I formulate complete and balanced fresh food diets for dogs. And I will tell you that every recipe has to have supplementation to be balanced. Omega-3 fatty acids, B vitamins, trace minerals, just like we need them, our dogs need them. Thank you, Diana. And Susan? Yes, so I actually don't make the, the bulk of my pet's food. So I, as I'd mentioned for my dogs, it's Evolution Wild Earth. V-Dog for my cats, it's Evolution and Ami Cat. For um, supplementation, I use nutritional yeast. Evolution has some delicious flavors of nutritional yeast. I will put in... Um, a cranberry supplement called Cranimals. It's cranberry powder. You can also get whole cranberries from Evolution or buy your own and dry them out and make powder. I found that a little tricky to do, but you can, you can do it yourself. And um, as mentioned, the, um, you got the veggie dog and veggie cat supplements from um, Compassion Circle. And there's also a really good, uh, enzyme supplement and I forget who makes it, um, but if I can look at that while someone else is talking and get that information. Um, at some point, Marlene, I would like to talk about my experience with a male cat who had a urinary issues. And I don't know if you want me to do that now or later. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I, I have a tale of three cats actually. My first cat, Prince, uh, although I was a vegan, he was not. <laughs> and he lived 13 years. He developed an enlarged heart and died of sudden, very suddenly of a heart attack. Didn't live that long. Um, and then I had, um, at about the same time, a kitten named Precious, who's now almost 17, and another cat named Henry, who I adopted from a shelter. And I was trying, and I had a feral cat colony that were all spayed and neutered. And I was starting feeding them evolution. And my cat, Henry, developed um, the urinary tract crystals. I, I don't remember the medical terminology, but he was very suddenly in a lot of pain. I rushed him to the vet. It's an invasive, um, there's <laughs> my <So> kitties <laughs> and my puppies. Um, he had to be catheterized and um, it's invasive and expensive. And I was told that I had to feed him a special diet that was very low in minerals that was made by one of the big pet food companies. I don't remember which, but it was basically a lot of um, lamb fat and lamb meat. And I was mortified because I was a vegan, but I also knew that this could be a fatal medical issue. So I started feeding him the food, the prescription food. And um, when I felt that he was pretty much stabilized after several months, I started phasing back in the evolution. This was the original formula, uh, formula of evolution. So this was about 18 years ago or so. He had a second bout of the urinary tract issues. Again, I had to rush him to the vet, get him um, treated. At that point, I was so scared. I just had to keep him on that horrible diet. Um, and he developed an enlarged heart. He was quite young, um, maybe four or five years old. And then one morning he, um, he had not sure what, whether it was a stroke or um, 
some sort of a blood clot or he became suddenly paralyzed in his hind end and was not getting any circulation. His whole hind end was cold. I rushed him to the vet and was told that, you know, he was in a lot of pain and they had some possibly some experimental invasive procedures that weren't likely to be successful or I could have him end his suffering, which I decided to have him um, euthanized. And um, he was only like five years old. And so with, I, I had a bunch of cats, but only one was male, which is precious. And I was terrified to have him be on a vegan diet. And at that point, and initially when I started buying the evolution, it was from um, Vegan Cats was the name of the place where I ordered it. And I noticed that they had started suddenly recommending that cats not be vegan and that there were these issues and I was terrified. And so I started feeding um, Precious Evolution, but then I would buy one can of tuna fish a week and give him a tablespoon in with his evolution to make it like 80% vegan, 20% not. Of course, I was feeding him not only abused and tortured tuna, but also mercury and um, radiation from Fukushima. You know, <laughs> So um, I did that for quite a while. My female cats, I was feeding them most of the time, just the evolution, they seemed to be fine. And then I started participating in a, it was a world peace diet weekly study group. And the um, Eric Weissman who makes evolution participated in that group. And he started talking about how to have vegan cats and how to you know, feed them distilled water, hydrate the food, keep them hydrated, use cranberry. Um, but that he would go keep repeating that animal-based products are highly toxic and cats can be vegan, but you have to be careful. And so I started, um, tra I transitioned Precious to a fully vegan diet. I started hydrating the food and putting the nutritional yeast for flavoring and some Ami cat on there because my cats love that and making sure they got lots and lots of water. And I have a water fountain that has, a, you know, a water bowl that has a fountain that's, that encourages water drinking. Um, so then my cats were all vegan. Then my house burned down in a wildfire. And so I didn't, I was temporarily housed. We were in a hotel for five days and then we stayed in, uh, at someone's house in a, above their garage for a couple of months. And so in the whole, that whole thing where um, the upheaval, I was just putting in, you know, tap water, the cats were getting tap water for like a week or two and the litter box was in a difficult place for them to get to and they weren't going to the bathroom and they were, ter you know, it was a lot of trauma for all of us. And so Precious all of a sudden one night started, um, I could tell he was in, in pain. He was squatting, kept going to the litter box. Nothing was coming out. I'm like, oh God, please not this. So I called Eric Weissman right away and I said, Precious is, you know, in a lot of pain. He's showing signs that, you know, he's got this urinary problem. And Eric said, well, it's, you know, this can, just know it can be fatal. So don't wait too long not to get, not to take him to a vet. I did not want to get him catheterized and th go through all that. So he told me some things to do immediately. One, get distilled water, get him off of the tap water, distilled water, get him some cranberry, get him, um, he gave me a couple of other um, um, things to give him, no, some herbs, noni and uva ursi were the two herbs and um, start use a, a broad syringe and start hydrating him with the herbs and also some vitamin C. And so I rushed to the store, I got the water, or the, luckily the pet store had some of the things that I needed as well. And I got the herbs and I immediately started giving him, hydrating him and giving him the herbs and the cranberry and the supplements. And by the next morning he was fine. 
um, and he's never had another issue and he's 100% vegan, but um, it is something that you need to be very careful around. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan. What disturbing things that can be found in commercial meat-based pet foods? Do they still use euthanized cats and dogs in commercial meat-based pet foods? Diana? Thanks, Marlene. So yeah, there's a lot of disturbing things that are found in meat-based pet foods. Um, you know, it's basically the lowest quality on the slaughterhouse floor is what's going to our companion animals. And, you know, I, I learned something that astounded even me, and I thought I knew a lot about this, but in 2019, I got together 17 of the leading um, vegan vets and scientists and nutritionists, including Dr. May, and we talked about these types of things for the Plant Powered Dog Food Summit. And one of the things that I learned is that if you have like, for example, a cow with a cancerous tumor, first of all, I didn't know at that time that if they, when they cut the tumor out and toss it on the floor, they can still put that into the human food system. Um, but I also learned that that tumor, where do you think it goes? Um, goes into pet food. So that's another thing we were talking about earlier. It's like feed a dog with cancer more meat. Um, so literally feed them cancer. So that's one of the things you have used restaurant grease. And we know when we fry things, it, it creates hydrogenated oils, trans fats, highly carcinogenic. Um, we have um, the environmental working group has found carcinogenic levels of fluoride in uh, foods with bone meal and other meals. Um, Dr. May was talking about, you know, the, the um, mercury, we've got hormones, we've got antibiotics, we've got persistent bioaccumulative uh, chemicals. So it's really like what isn't in them that's bad. Um, uh, when it comes, you know, uh, the 4D animals, dead, diseased, dying, and disabled, um, you know, our dogs and cats in pet food, um, obviously they're not supposed to be. <laughs> um, I do believe that they have found them in there before. And, and I don't know if maybe Dr. May can speak to that better than I can, but obviously they're not supposed to be, but I think that things like that have been found in pet foods. Thank you, Diana. Dr. May, any studies that have been conducted showing that either or both dogs and cats can thrive on a vegan diet? And are you familiar with the Cats Thrive on a Vegan Diet in Peer Reviewed Study, and another one in 2021, Vegan Cat Study by BMC Veterinary Research. Thank you, Marlene. There's a great need for further study always, uh, especially with cat health in terms of dogs. Dogs are omnivores and they can thrive on a whole plant-based vegan diet as long as it's nutritionally complete and balanced. So uh, dogs have been living with humans for thousands of years and they have adapted to, to eating plants and they can thrive on that. I, I've visited India and I've seen dogs eating plant matter, chapatis, all kinds of grains and they're existing in harmony with nature in that environment. In fact, there are entire vegetarian cities in India where dogs live. So, we know that in Thailand also, uh, I have a colleague out of Australia um, who has fed dogs and cats uh, vegan food in Thailand and India. So uh, we know that this can be done uh, from these large case studies. Uh, there are some more formal scientific studies that have been done as well. Uh, there was a study on dogs on a meat-free diet by measuring their complete blood count and showing that they did have adequate energy for exercising uh, being on this plant-based diet. There is also a study that's just now been completed um, out of Western University College of Veterinary Medicine in Pomona, California that will be published very soon. And um, it, it's shown some very encouraging results with dogs on plant-based diets as well. Uh, we don't have as much information about cats. Uh, there, there always are challenges getting funding for these sorts of studies, but uh, hopefully 
as time goes on, there will be more of that available. But we know that cats are also very flexible, you know, compared to, say, uh, a lion or you know, a true wild carnivore. In that, and they have also been domesticated. They they do have certain requirements, though, that dogs do not necessarily have, such as the, the need for taurine. Although there are certain breeds of dogs who do need more taurine, and can run into issues with their heart if they don't have enough of that. But as long as the diet is nutritionally complete and balanced and the cat is consuming the food and not losing weight or going on a hunger strike, uh, it can be a very healthy option. It is important, especially for male cats, to have their urinary tract health closely monitored because of the potential for urinary crystals that if left unchecked can lead to urethral obstruction or a blockage where the cat cannot urinate. And that is a life-threatening emergency, which we don't wanna have happen, obviously. It is something that happens to meat-eating cats as well, though, uh, who are consuming mostly kibble-based diets. So for male cats especially, it's important to hydrate the food, ensure adequate water intake, which is what happens when they're on a wet food diet, because even on the dry food, they, they just don't consume enough water. It doesn't integrate into their cells the same way as it would if they were eating fresh or wet food. There are acidifiers that can be used uh, for, for cats and dogs who have issues with too alkaline of a urine. They're, they can have vitamin C and or methionine added in, um, but that should be done under the guidance of a veterinarian after the urinalysis has already been checked, uh, not preemptively because there are cases where they wouldn't have that indication for that and that can cause problems if it's not indicated and it's added in. So it's always important to check with your vet. There, there are um, some other vet, vegan vets out there who are supportive or at least um, understanding of dogs and cats being on vegan diets. If you find that you, you'd rather find um, a vet who is more supportive, who's not in your area, you can always contact me. I can speak with your vet and help them understand some of the science behind this as well. Um, and my website is veganvet.net. Anyone who wants to have an individual phone or Skype consultation with me. Thank you, Dr. Matt. A response to the statement that dogs and cats do not naturally eat a vegan diet. Matthew? Hi, yeah, so uh, that's a definitely a good response. And in, in the vegan community, when you're doing outreach to human animals, uh, a lot of counter times, you'll, you'll, you'll hear the thing, well, what about lions? What about, you know, um, what about dogs and stuff like that? And so it is an interesting conundrum because um, some of the best arguments for vegan is the natural argument saying like, you know, we're biological herbivores as humans and therefore, you know, dogs are uh, biological omnivores if, if I understand correctly. Um, so why would you um, kind of make that unnatural? But um, certainly what we're doing, what dogs are doing today is very unnatural with, you know, everything from us, the way we live and houses and all that stuff. So interjecting into that natural loop, I think is okay. Um, especially considering they can thrive uh, while not doing it. Uh, another argument I kind of, I did want to kind of explore in our own minds was that um, it, it's very alarming for many of us, uh, vegan and non-vegan who care about our pets, the, the idea that dogs and cats could or would have, or have ever been used in that food supply chain for other um, companion animals. And it's disturbing because we, we can connect with these pets and we can identify with them and we, we know that they feel pain and we know that they suffer and we know that they love. And so it becomes just like a, a pull in our gut, the idea that this could happen. And, uh, but when you take that same process and you allowed your mind to just kind of go there and you go a little bit deeper and you realize, well, why would it be any different that we're, we're allowing that to happen to cows or pigs or chickens or any of the other animals that are used for for food, for either human or non-human animals or, or companion animals. So as far as being natural, I would definitely, uh, you can you can go back and forth with arguing, you know, what's natural, you know, we don't live in a natural world, but, um, you know, yeah, I think you can go 
yeah, any direction you want with that. But the point is, at the end of the day, is can you live a life without causing unnecessary harm? And is it really that big of a convenience, inconvenience? And which it's not, like you might think it is, but at the end of the day, it ends up just being way easier. Uh, my dogs are thriving so much. So my family, we grew up with um, golden retrievers and they would pass away at like eight or nine years old. And, and we didn't have a lot of money growing up and we would buy the cheapest kibble that we could. And you would just see them deteriorate from like years six to nine. They would just kind of just go downhill. Um, my dog, vegan or Happy here, has been vegan for um, eight or nine years. And he's 11 or 10 and a half now. And he's still like a puppy. And um, he every day he comes home and he runs. Um, a funny story happened to my dog was that uh, my, my vegan dog is he lost a lot of blood. He had this like growth on him kind of unrelated and uh, he lost a lot of blood. I thought I was draining it, but long story short, I'd, I had a veterinarian tell me that, um, oh, he's gonna be on pills for a long time because he's got a heart arrhythmia now. And it was very sad. My wife and I were really dealing with this and we didn't know what to do. And we were just like devastated. Um, but we took Happy home and within like two days, he was the, his puppy self again and just fully, fully on board and everything. Uh, we later went to go uh, get like a, a little rash looked at at a vet and a different vet was examining his heart and he said this this dog has the heart of an athlete and I just remember being so blown away that we had one vet tell us that you know we we're going to be on pills for a heart arrhythmia for the rest of his life um, to the next vet saying that this is the, the the best sounding heart that this vet has ever heard and you know of course, I, I, I got to brag on being vegan to this, this vet, which was, it was definitely new to them. And so I, I do know that dogs' hearts are like our hearts and, and without that cholesterol. And I also noticed that someone mentioned coconut oil and stuff like that. Now, I'm not saying don't do oil, but you know, uh, we should try to definitely limit our oil, I believe, uh, both for human and non-human animals. But someone uh, which should talk to that better than I do, yeah. And Marlene, I just want to jump in very quickly and sort of, um, and, you know, springboarding from what Matthew was saying, sort of, I want to say, take issue with the whole um, presumption that it's unnatural um, that dogs eat a plant-based diet. And the reason is that dogs and humans have been hanging out together for longer than any other two species, except for um, plankton or something like that. Um, but so we're talking, you know, there are studies that go all the way back to the Neolithic period. Some studies that go back, you know, 10, 11, 12,000 years, it's possible that it's tens of thousands of years that dogs and humans have been traveling together and dogs have been eating, you know, they didn't eat high-end meat. It wasn't, this just wasn't how it was done. They ate legumes, they ate wheat, they ate grains. So in all reality, a species appropriate diet for dogs, if we really want to look at how they've gone back thousands of years with people, could very well be a plant-based diet, so. Thank you, Diana. Dr. May, what are the steps to take to transition a dog or cat to a vegan diet? Yes, thanks. And I just wanted to dovetail about the natural argument and add in that Dogs and cats receive veterinary care. That's unnatural, if you will. If, if they were left to their own devices out in the wild, left to be predated upon, hit by a car, having to, being subjected to parasitism, that they wouldn't have a healthy existence either. So by virtue of them being in our homes, that is itself somewhat unnatural, getting meals on a consistent basis. So what... I believe the important question is, is what is healthy, not just what's natural. And the current state of this world has gotten to a point, unfortunately, to where toxins are ubiquitous and it's almost impossible to avoid them entirely. So the best that we can do is to minimize the toxins that we're exposed to through our diet, our water, our, our air, uh, and same for our animal companions. So by offering distilled or spring water so they don't have the fluoride in there, which is a neurotoxin. Uh, same for us humans. And of course, 
being mindful of the diet and minimizing the toxins there, we're actually providing a healthier option for them that's maybe not what they would be eating in the wild, but it's actually healthier for them in the long run. And uh, as to how to transition, it, it depends on the, the patient. I, my patients are dogs and cats. And so if I see a dog who's accustomed to being offered, say, table scraps, various different snacks of, of different sorts and has consistent stool, then it won't be as necessary to do a gradual transition compared to a dog that already has some gastrointestinal problems. It, it, it varies based on the individual, but ultimately uh, we wanna pay attention to minimizing a sudden transition so that they have time to adapt to it and that they don't refuse the food entirely. For example, cats tend to be pickier eaters. So if they are just presented with a new food item that they've not seen before, they may just turn their nose up at it and not eat it. And then the food may go bad and then one has to start again. So adding in little bits of the new food, the vegan food with the animal-based food over the course of 10 days or so, adding in more and more of the vegan food can help the cat familiarize with the new food and then eventually hopefully adapt to it. And there, there may be some transitional rocky road of trying to get them to adapt to it. If they don't like the food, you can add in uh, smoke flavored as, uh, substances to, to make it flavorful for them uh, along with the nutritional yeast. You can warm up the food to bring out the aromas. You can also add in things like tofu and tamari in you know, small amounts. There's a, a recipe from Dr. Pitcairn's Complete Guide to Natural Health that has uh, tofu, nutritional yeast, one tablespoon of tamari, and the veggie cat. You can also use things like peas and carrots, pumpkin and squash to add in for cats to have enough fiber because a lot of cats don't get sufficient fiber if they're eating a meat-based diet, even if they're not gonna be vegan, adding in at least some peas and carrots or pumpkin or squash can help provide fiber and phytonutrients to help them have a healthier digestion in general. But um, you know, if some cats may be prone to urinary problems, you might wanna just do 50-50 if it's difficult to get a urinalysis on a regular basis or at least twice a year. Some cats, uh, they're not gonna to take to the food and then they're gonna to have to be more flexitarians, but whatever we can do to make that transition easier for them will make it more successful in the long run. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Susan, will you please tell us about your dog Rocky's vaccine injury and your dog Talia's quick recovery from a rattlesnake bite to her cornea? Yes, yes. So I have um, five chihuahuas, all are from rescues or shelters. And um, one, uh, a year and a half ago, year and a half ago, my dog Rocky went in for his, his rabies booster, which is a vaccination, which is required uh, for all dogs, I believe in all 50 states. It's the only one that's required in California. So he had his um, rabies booster and about one week later, he threw up in the middle of the night, a very weird green vomit in bed. And he always gets up with me in the first thing in the morning, he did not get up. Um, and I knew something was wrong. So I took him to the vet right away. And they um, did blood work. And my vet said, your dog needs to, a blood transfusion right away. And we can't do that you need to take him to the 24 hour um, veterinary care facility, which is about 90 miles away. And um, he said, it can't, can't wait till tomorrow. Um, so I took him to um, the pet hospital and they immediately put him in an oxygen chamber and um, did some blood work and told me that yes, he needed, he definitely needed at least one transfusion and that is a risky 
treatment, but that um, he, it was critical. It was life threatening. And I thought back to, he had had his booster the week before and all of a sudden this happened. And so I asked both my vet and the specialists, I said, could it be, because they were saying, well, it could be, it seemed like his, his body was destroying its own re, um, red blood cells is what his body was doing. It was an autoimmune response. And I said, well, what he had, the, could it have been the rabies booster that triggered this autoimmune response? And these are traditional vets. These are not vegan vets. And they both said, yes, it, it could be. To where my vet, my regular vet, again, not vegan, is um, going to exempt Rocky from rabies vaccines, which requires him to write a letter to the, um, the board that oversees vaccines because um, he, he won't vaccinate Rocky again. So Rocky spent a week in the 24 hour care facility. Um, he required two blood transfusions and uh, plus um, a pretty heavy dose of steroids to stop the autoimmune response and some other um, medications. And um, He's recovered, he's fully recovered now. He had to get blood work um, every month for about a year just to monitor and gradually face him off of the medications because you can't do it immediately. He's not on any medication. He's fine, he's healthy, he's um, great. But it was enough of a scare to me that I, um, like, I, I won't do any vaccines except the rabies because that's our legal requirement. And quite frankly, if my dogs bit someone and weren't rabies vaccinated, they could be destroyed. So, um, but Rocky is fine. He's recovered from that. And I, um, that is pretty miraculous. Um, Tal so Talia Rose, six pound chihuahua. I've got rattlesnakes where I, where I live in a rural area. A year ago, uh, we were walking on leash and a rattlesnake was in the grass and bit her in, in the cornea, in her eye, the fang went into her cornea. And she's only six pounds. So the rattlesnake didn't buzz her. It was thinking, here's a good meal. So, um, and that could be fatal for an animal that small. Um, fortunately, it was a weekday morning. I picked her up, carried her, called the vet, said, I'm coming down. She was, um, on the IV getting the anti-venom treatment within 30 minutes of being bitten. Um, the vet was concerned that um, she could lose her eye. And so I, once they stabilized her overnight, I had to take her again to the, to the I had to take her to the eye specialist the next morning and um, there were two possibilities, one that she could lose her eye or lose the sight. But what was quite uh, miraculous is that she had a full recovery. Um, she didn't lose her sight. She just has a scar on her face. I wish she was sitting here, I would pick her up. She has a scar where her tissue died on her face. But I think between her being super healthy and one thing that I did, in addition to what the veterinarians gave to me, the, the antibiotics and other, the eye treatments, I gave her um, some uh, vitamins, a little bit of vitamin C powder, again, through consulting with Eric Weissman. Now I know I could call Dr. May as well, but through consulting with Eric Weissman, I gave her some vitamin C in a syringe. So the first, when I brought her home the first night after her being on the anti-venom treatment all day, she was um, unable to, I didn't know, I, I, she spent the night there. So I brought, got her the next morning and she couldn't even stand up. She was, her body was like rigor mortis. She couldn't stand up or sit up. I took her to the eye specialist in that condition, took her back to the vet. They gave her a steroid injection, brought her home, put her in a crate, gave her some of the vitamin C in syringe. 
And um, she was up and running the next morning like everything was fine. So um, yeah, those are my two near death experiences, recent experiences with my dogs. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. There are natural, non-invasive and holistic therapies that do not compromise one's vegan values that can be beneficial for our companion animals. Dr. May, can you please explain some of the vegan holistic therapies, including homeopathy, essential oils, ozone therapy, laser and acupuncture. Also, what homeopathic remedies to avoid because they are not vegan, that they contain animal products. And then two more questions with it. What are ingredients in vaccines that are not vegan? And for a vaccine to be FDA approved, does that need to be tested on animals? Dr. May. So I'd like to comment on Susan's story and I'm sorry about what happened to her dog. And I'm glad that the dog is better now, thank God. There actually is a patient of mine right now who suffered an adverse vaccine reaction, a puppy, upon receiving his fourth distemper parvo vaccine by another veterinarian, he began having some chattering of his teeth, which interestingly is one of the signs that one may observe with the distemper disease itself but not the full range of symptoms was experienced by this dog. And I have him on a homeopathic remedy. I, I don't make homeopathic recommendations on a across the board basis. The way homeopathy works, it's very individualized based upon the individual patient and his or her full range of emotional, mental and physical symptoms. There's not a, a cookie cutter approach to it the way in conventional medicine we would prescribe a certain antibiotic or steroid or, or some other anti-inflammatory or some other medication. It, it's not a, a standard approach. So it really depends on the individual patient and the full range of emotional, physical, and mental symptoms that that patient exhibits that will then lead us to picking a remedy for that particular patient. The beauty of homeopathy is that it's very gentle on the body. It can have a, a really um, curative effect if the right remedy is selected because it works on a root level with the patient's vital force. It's not a well understood modality here in the United States because unfortunately, that's been squashed by the pharmaceutical industry over time. They've favored surgical and pharmaceutical interventions over homeopathy, which has led to a cascade of problems, you know, the shutdowns of homeopathy schools, the uh, maligning of homeopathy as a, a medical practice, but it, it has a lot of applications for humans and non-human animals. It's offered in all sorts of countries around the world, India, Mexico, Germany, you know, many countries that have utilized it for a wide variety of medical conditions successfully. Now, there are times when someone might take a homeopathic remedy and not experience the desired result. And that could be for a number of reasons. It could be that it wasn't well suited for that particular person's situation. It could be that the remedy wasn't taken appropriately. It wasn't monitored. The progress in response to the remedy wasn't monitored and the follow-up remedies weren't given at the right frequency and potency. So there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, what I suggest if people who may be watching this are interested in learning about homeopathy, to read a book by Dr. Wendy Jensen called The Practical Handbook of Veterinary Homeopathy. It's a small book may take a couple of hours to read, and it'll allow for a basic foundational understanding of this modality to be able to begin to see how it might apply in your particular circumstance. Now, in addition to homeopathy, there are other modalities such as herbs, essential oils, ozone treatment, which has a lot of applications as well that I utilize in my practice, 
Ozone therapy is, is used in human medicine as well, and there are many different applications for it. It can help with treating infections. It can help with wound healing. It can even be a good adjunct for treating patients who are suffering from cancer, uh, human and non-human animals. And there are a variety of ways that it can be administered. So ozone, uh, just as an overview, it basically is O3. So that's an oxygen molecule with an extra oxygen atom that is an unstable molecule. And it, it's mostly the oxygen that's administered, but there is a small percentage, about 3% or so of ozone or O3 that is included when it's administered, often through rectal administration for small animals. It can also be given as an intravenous injection if it's combined with the patient's blood, which is something called major autohemotherapy. There's also minor autohemotherapy in which a small sample of blood is collected. It's mixed with the patient's uh, vital fluids and some ozone that's then administered as an intramuscular injection. There is subcutaneous ozonated fluids that can be given under the skin of a patient. So uh, then there's also gas, ozonated gas, ozonated fluids for flushing wounds, ozone gas to give on wounds to help them heal in lieu of antibiotics. We've learned that antibiotics, while they may have a place in certain circumstances, they can also have negative long-term consequences for overall health, including reduction in the natural flora of the patient. So that means that that can lead to antibiotic resistance and depress their immune system over time. So instead of using antibiotics, one can use ozone for treating wounds, for flushing the dental cavity when dental cleanings are done, also uh, bagging limbs that are compromised, say like a dog fight wound or something like that. One can actually infuse ozone gas into a bag that's surrounding this injured limb to assist in the healing process. So uh, that's just an overview, but uh, there, there's a lot more that can be said about it. There are courses that can be taken. There are a lot of books out there about it as well. It's again, not as well known in the United States, unfortunately, again, because of the, the squashing by the pharmaceutical industry. But there, it's important to understand that um, we have a lot of options available if we just seek them out. And they may not be advertised, they may not be pushed as heavily as we hear about the other options, but they, they, they are out there. What was the other question that you had about vegan yes. versus? Yes. Right. Okay, so most of the homeopathic remedies are vegan because they're, they're derived from plants, um, most of them. They're, they're just a, a small number of them that are derived from animal sources. And there are thousands of remedies out there. Um, so basically it's, it's like a sugar dilution that's done with this particular substance that's diluted down until there's no actual physical substance remaining, but it, it's through a process called dilution and succussion where the substance is progressively diluted more and more until there's just the energetics of it remaining. And that goes into how potent it may be for a particular patient, depending on the patient's vital force, whether it's appropriate to give something that is stronger or less potent based upon what that patient can handle. And that is explained more in that book that I mentioned by Dr. Wendy Jensen, The Practical Handbook of Veterinary Homeopathy. So yes, there are vegan options available. There, there are also the majority of the Chinese herbs are, are plant-based. There are also some Western herbs that can be used for different things. So there, there's a plethora of options. If people are trying to find a holistic vet, depending on where you live, you can look at ahvma.org. That's the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association website and search based on your location for a holistic vet. Um, may or may not be a vegan vet, but you can educate them about veganism. So can, they can educate you about holistics and, and vice versa. So it's, it's a good thing to continue to spread our vegan message while learning about other options that we may not have known about. Thank you. Thank you. The other two questions. One is what ingredients are in vaccines that are not vegan 
and for a vaccine to be FDA approved, does that mean that it's tested on animals? Dr. May. In the, in the current uh, vaccine scenario, it's not a true vaccine. The COVID shots are actually experimental gene modification injections and they're marketed as biologics. So that exempts them from safety testing, unfortunately. So they're not held under the same rigor as normal pharmaceutical drugs, even in terms of uh, the, the level of safety testing that's required. And in this instance, with, with the COVID shots that are being rolled out currently, they are not actually FDA approved as such. They use the term emergency use authorization to designate an uh, authorization for them to be used given what they claim is a imminent need under this quote unquote emergency. But you know that is a bit of a, a long discussion to be had for what we're talking about here. But you know it is something that they can deviate from those standards. Animal testing is often used, unfortunately, in vaccine development. And in this particular instance, although these vaccines, who knows what's all in them, it's not something that we, we have complete knowledge of, but there are uh, you know, concerns about aborted fetal tissue being sourced as a, a base for culturing the, the vaccines, as well as dog kidney cells, mice cells, all kinds of uh, animal derived tissue bases that are used for the basis for these vaccines. And uh, there's a lot I could say about vaccines, but uh, I think overall less is more in terms of health and longevity for humans and, and non-humans, um, the fewer the better, honestly. So if one can avoid them, that would be what I would recommend. If it's a situation where a dog has to get a rabies shot to get a license, that's that's understandable. You know, it's a, it's a dilemma. I won't say that it's a perfect scenario because it's not. There is a doctor, a veterinarian, Dr. John Robb, who has a group called Protect the Pets, which you can go to protectthepets.com and learn about what he's talking about. And yes, there, there are titer testing options available, which I do offer to clients if they're interested in that. We can do a blood test to check antibody levels in lieu of re boostering a particular shot. There, there is the option to do that for the rabies test and the rabies vaccine. Uh, when I was in vet school, of course, I had my rabies shot. Uh, this was before I was as knowledgeable about vaccinosis, which is harm that comes from a vaccine. That is actually a term that describes the different types of issues, whether they are autoimmune disorders, as was mentioned earlier, the dog had autoimmune, autoimmune hemolytic anemia or uh, cancer, any number of uh, allergy issues that can pop up uh, that, that could be related to over-vaccination. So if people wanna avoid those problems, then I think um, checking the titer level, like I had my titer checked, I had to be vaccinated for rabies in order to become a veterinarian. And then I didn't have it boosted because I didn't want to expose my body to more toxins. And I, I had my blood checked uh, about 10 years ago. The titers were more than sufficient. So there's not been any reason to, to re-booster my rabies vaccine. So when I look at what happens to animals, I also care about their health. I don't want them to be unnecessarily boosted either. And I, I want to have people make that decision, understanding there are risks and benefits to both scenarios. But if the dog does bite someone, it can lead to a, a big legal nightmare. And uh, that's, that's what someone has to make an informed decision about. Now I can provide a certificate of immunity based upon a tighter result, but whether that will be considered valid by the authorities is a whole nother question. And ultimately what this, whole conversation leads to is a need for people to make their voices heard because as soon as people gather together and voice their concerns to community officials and and those who make these decisions then we can affect positive changes but if it's just kept to you know one's own individual decision and not influencing society at large then we're all kind of struggling with these issues without getting to where you know we'd like to go with them.
Thank you, Dr. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists, Diana, Matthew, and Susan. And this concludes the Q&A section of this webinar. Thank you all. Lisa? Great. Well, thank you also, Marlene. That was, those questions were really, really interesting. And that was really the panel discussion part, the interview part of what we're doing today. Um, so we will be moving on along. Uh, now it's time for your questions for the attendees. So I'm going to ask if everyone can please use the Q&A feature that's uh, part of the Zoom platform to send us your questions. I think the chat box will be a little overwhelming. <laughs> so let's try to use the Q&A feature. And we may not be able to answer all of the questions today, but we certainly will try. So as we get started here, I'd like to take a moment and just show you a couple of vegan, healthy vegan patients <laughs> that were referenced in some of the previous discussions. So let's see here. All right, let's get you going with our share screen for just a brief moment. There we go. So here you can see a lovely image of Miko who's thriving on vegan food. And I believe this one of the attendees um, is associated with this sweet sweetheart here. And another group of vegan animals who are thriving. So it's really exciting and wonderful to see pictures that some people have submitted of their other animal companions who are enjoying the vegan life. So for now, what I'd like to do is to go to some of the Q&A. So we're going to answer a few of these questions. They might come out randomly. And uh, as far as the panelists who can answer them, if you could see which ones you you feel most drawn towards. You're welcome to unmute yourself and, and answer. I think that's totally fine. So here's, here's one. What about taurine if it's not added to the kibble? Uh, Bianca, who's submitting this question, says she does supplement as when she was asked with the different vets. They said that they can't test it in the blood tests. So the question is, it's about taurine. Does anyone want to answer that in reference to cats? Sure, I'd be happy to answer about the taurine. It actually can be tested. It's a rather expensive blood test, uh, but it can be done to measure taurine levels in cats or dogs. If there's insufficient funds to do the test, then you can add in the supplement just to be on the safe side if it doesn't already contain it in the food. I do believe the test, Dr. May, is it out of UC Davis, the whole blood taurine test? Yes, I think that's UC right. UC Davis does that test. Most, I will say that most of the plant-based, now I speak from the perspective of canine nutrition, most of the plant-based dog foods, the commercial foods have taurine and carnitine added in. If you have one that does not, um, Definitely, I would add in a taurine supplement. It is a safe supplement, and there are potential DCM-related, cardiac-related issues due to lack of taurine. So you want to add that in on your own. Right. Thank you, Diana. Also wanted to ask, a, this is a different question. So Nancy asks that, mentioned that one of the attendees who asked in the chat about the supplements and which are needed. For example, if there's a diet composed of one half commercial vegan kibble and one half homemade foods. And this is something she feels is important to address because it's a really common approach for most people. I, I can begin to speak to that, which is, first of all, um, you don't want to add additional vitamin and mineral supplementation to an already complete and balanced commercial food. 
because then you run the chance of toxic levels of certain vitamins and minerals. Um, normally, it's, it's a little bit tricky, but I mean, normally I say that if you're adding like at least 75% of the commercial food, if you have that, and maybe 25% of a fresh food, that you really don't need to worry about additional supplementation at all because commercial foods have over, they have more than 100% of an RDA of supplements. Um, when you get to be half and half, you might want to add a proportionate amount, say a veggie dog, to your um, fresh food, but you don't want to add in as if you were just feeding a fresh food diet, you, you know, because you have to be aware that they're still getting a lot of supplementation from that 50% of the commercial food. So maybe just, a, you know, a quarter of what it would be recommended on the, uh, on the manufacturer's product. Great, thank you. So here's a different question that we haven't addressed yet, which is, what do you think of the cultured meat movement for companion animal food? Or is this just furthering the same problem that we now have with so-called you know, pet food? Uh, I can address that and anyone else. I have concerns about the cultured meat movement. One concern is that there is a need to my understanding for a base that is non-vegan, which would involve fetal calf serum to be harvested, which is a kind of a euphemism for slaughtering a baby cow in order to have a, a way to formulate this product. So that is troubling ethically. Also, it normalizes the idea of, of eating flesh. Now, if it's for, for cats, it's understandable because they are naturally carnivores, but the driving force for this would be the human market. and. I'm seeing a trend towards this idea of, of normalizing flesh eating being somewhat embraced by the vegan movement, which I find a little bit unsettling. I think that what's healthiest is best for the planet and is the most ethical way to live is consuming a whole foods plant-based diet. And the more that we can share that message with everyone, the more people can get healthier and not be reliant on pharmaceutical drugs that actually are not helping them in the long run. Okay. Any others? Anyone else want to address that? I think that's an interesting question to think um, because eventually this, this answer is, we have to ask a question like, what, where are we going with life as human existence? And Eventually, we'd like to obviously um, cohabitat this earth with animals in a way that they're free and not commodities and resources. And it does introduce an interesting question about our, our natural carnivores, which we share this planet with. And I don't have the right answer for what that would look like. And, and by certainly, I definitely don't recommend um, the cultured meat. Uh, movement, especially for animals or, I mean, for dogs or for, for humans. But I do wonder in 100, 200, 300 years, if when, when we achieve this vegan world, what it would look like with our natural carnivores of the planet. Like and I, and I'm thinking, you know, tigers and lions and, and I don't know what that would look like. Maybe the best would be just to l l leave them alone and not in, um, inter you know, no intervention. Great. Well, thank you for addressing that question. I know it's one that's been on people's minds. Uh, also, a kind of a concrete question. Is there a directory of animal nutritionists, dietitians? Um, the person mentions that they haven't found a vet in their area that supports feeding large breed, a large breed puppy a vegan diet and wants to make sure that all of the dietary supplements are being met for proper development. So There's a, oh, sorry. I, I will give myself a plug here and say that that's what I do for a living is um, obviously I'm a vegan canine nutritionist and I have a master's in animal science and I solely formulate plant-based um, dog diets. So you're absolutely right. And I understand why the vet is concerned because unfortunately, um, if you don't do 
well, any oh. diet, but especially a puppy diet and especially a large breed puppy diet. If it's not done right, you're unfortunately setting your dog up for life, life, lifelong harm. If, on, the, on the plus side, I'm getting more and more people coming to me with puppies and large breed puppies who want to do it the right way. They want to start their dog out um, with a whole foods plant-based diet and ensure that it's properly um, balanced. I can actually create a diet with the same parameters as a commercial large breed puppy food, but with a whole foods plant-based, um, with whole foods plant-based foods. So you can do that. Um, and I would also recommend finding a vet who is more receptive to it because you're going to have this relationship for a very long time. Great. Well, thank you. I, I, oh, yes. I, I'd like to touch on that. So. I live in a rural area and I, it's very important that I have a veterinarian near my home. I'd mentioned the rattlesnake bite and the Rockies immune response where it was really critical that I have a local veterinarian. My veterinarian is not vegan. I provided them with information on vegan diets for dogs and cats. I don't think they ever read it. It's still in my animal's file. <laughs> um, but I think what I've been able to show them through being a, a repeat um, client, they can see that my animals are thriving. So they don't recommend veganism, but they no longer bother me or um, suggest that I'm doing something wrong because they can see how well cared for my animals are. That's very encouraging. It truly is. So there's a question here that is has some jargon. So hopefully one of you can answer it. Um, the DCM question. There was a question about this DCM. So if somebody could explain what that is and then um, maybe discuss a little bit about that. Yeah, I can address that. Dilated cardiomyopathy or DCM is a heart condition where the muscle of the heart becomes flabby and it can lose its ability to effectively pump as well and eventually lead to heart failure if not addressed appropriately. So it is a condition that can affect uh, dogs like Doberman, Pinchers, Afghan Hounds, St. Bernard's and Cocker Spaniels as well as some other breeds that are prone to it. Even other breeds could potentially have that if they don't have enough taurine. Dogs usually are able to synthesize taurine through eating foods that have precursors of taurine, such as methionine and cysteine. And it's been found that uh, the grain-free diets are lower in those amino acids, which might lead them to having taurine deficiencies and possibly resulting in dilated cardiomyopathy. There are taurine and carnitine supplements that can be provided if there is an at-risk breed or if the food is, is grain-free. But the, the vegetarian vegan formulas that we have for dogs are usually containing grain. So I don't see where that would be a problem for dogs that are consuming a well-balanced diet. Well, that's great news. <laughs> so um, question here, what is a nutritionally balanced meal, a home prepared meal for cats. There's a recipe uh, for wild tofu in Dr. Richard Pitcairn's book, uh, which you can order on Amazon. It's uh, the fourth edition that has recipes for both dogs and cats that are plant-based. And since cats do require more fat to be healthy, uh, it, it does have tofu as the main ingredient along with nutritional yeast, tamari, veggie cat as a supplement. And then you can use a topping with pumpkin or uh, corn or some other uh, vegetable to make it more well-rounded. Okay, thanks, Armighty. You know, Lisa, if you don't mind, I've seen a couple of questions on oils in the chats. Sure. So I'd love to answer that again as it pertains to dogs. So first of all, someone asked a good question about omega-3s. Um, so there are different types of essential fatty acids for dogs. Um, there are omega-6 fatty acids. Um, that's arachidonic acid, which is only essential for puppies. Then there's linoleic acid. Then there are omega-3 fatty acids, okay? And there are three types. Now, 
Two of those types, EPA and DHA, can only come from marine sources. So the question was asked, what about flax seeds? Flax seeds cannot be substituted for EPA and DHA. Dogs do not convert the type of essential fatty acid in flax seeds uh, adequately to make those other essential fatty acids. So they have to come from a marine source. The happy news is um, it doesn't have to be um, an animal-based marine source. So there are tons of vegan omega-3 fatty acids out there with EPA and DHA, and they come from the, um, the ocean's version of plants from phytoplankton. So they come from marine algae. Um, I use one called Diva. Um, uh, gosh, Nordic Naturals makes one. But the, the message is you can't substitute flax seeds, you can't substitute hemp seeds, and God knows you can't substitute coconut oil because it contains no essential fatty acids. So you do need EPA and DHA from marine sources, and you need to have um, all of these things covered uh, adequately. And again, that's you know something that's worth exploring more to really do it right in a diet. Thank you, Diana. So, a um, couple other. We've got so many questions, and we'll we have a few more minutes to address them. Um, so, I'm wondering, is so one question would be, what do you think? This is another kind of healing related question. What do you think about the use of CBD oil? There, there's a lot that can be said about CBD. It's a whole topic unto itself. I would just recommend that uh, if you are interested in looking into that, there's a whole chapter in this book by Jan Allegretti, The Complete Holistic Dog Book, that's devoted to the topic of CBD. It's important to, to research it and consult with a professional to know the right dosage for your animal companion and regarding the specific condition. There's really not enough time to go into the specifics about it, but it's important to, to look at it closely because there are pros and cons depending on the dosage that's used, the sourcing, et cetera. Fair enough. <laughs> Thanks, Armighty. So this is um, another question that is more specific, but uh, Victoria says that her dog has been vegan for six months and his recent blood test shows that he's got a high cholesterol of 365, but he's not overweight. Um, how is that possible? There, there may be conditions in which the cholesterol is elevated uh, due to some other condition like hypothyroidism in dogs, it can cause cholesterol to be elevated, hypercholesterolemia. It can be due to other factors. It, you know, it is made by the liver, but if there's not excess cholesterol in the diet, it would be surprising that the cholesterol would be elevated uh, unless the dog is hypothyroid. Is it, is it the case, Dr. Melo, that we don't have to worry as much about high cholesterol in dogs as we do in people? as it doesn't uh, as directly translate necessarily into heart disease like it does with, with people. I think so. If, if it's not terribly elevated, I wouldn't be, be very concerned about it, but you know, depending on how high above the normal range the cholesterol is, you know, may warrant further exploration into to why that might be. But yeah, generally, if it's just a tad above normal, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, so um, a couple other questions. One was about lentils and urinary tract issues. And perhaps, you know, Dr. May, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Is there something about lentils that causes urinary tract issues? Uh, not that I'm aware of specifically, no. Uh, as we talked about already, generally there are issues with the urinary tract health in dogs and cats, especially if their urine is too alkaline or basic in the pH, which could happen if they're eating lentils and other foods as well. But I don't think it's anything that's specific to lentils per se over other uh, alkaline foods, which in humans is a healthier thing because we are more herbivorous, but for dogs and cats especially, we're more carnivorous their 
diets need to be a little acidified sometimes if they are developing struvite or ammonium magnesium phosphate crystals that can develop when the pH of the urine is too alkaline. So it is a good idea after doing the transition to monitor the urine, take your dog or cat to your vet, have a urinalysis performed to see where the pH level and crystal levels are at. And then from there make modifications if needed. Sometimes there won't be a need for that, especially if the diet is moist and adding water to, to freshen up and soften the kibble can be a good option for those who don't wanna do the canned food or if the cat is not eating the canned food, you may have to provide kibble unless you do the home cooked option. So it's just important to take it on a case by case basis and see how the animal responds, check their urinalysis. You can also do a blood test and then from there make the needed adjustments. Well, we have another cat question and <laughs> this one's from Carla. She has five cats and three are 95% vegan. The other two are not vegan yet, pre-vegans. One of them, Sparkle, was diagnosed with kidney disease. Another cat, Keys, was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. Both Sparkle and Keys are on prescription diets and Carla would like all of her cats to be vegan. Is there any, any way to do that? Is that possible? I think it depends on the cats and, and how well they would take to the food if they're willing to adapt and transition towards it. As far as hyperthyroidism, that is commonly seen, unfortunately. There could be flame retardant chemicals in carpeting, furniture, sofas, mattresses that are endocrine disruptors that can lead to these disorders in our animal companions. It, even for human health, I think it's worth considering an organic cotton mattress as opposed to the chemical mattresses so that you know eight hours out of the day that we're spending sleeping and then perhaps more than that that our cats are spending sleeping on our beds they are not exposed to these flame retardant chemicals and it may be a bit more of expense initially to invest in that but in the long run can be good but you know once the cat already has hyperthyroidism there generally are, are three main treatment options you know short of more holistic homeopathic approaches that you know can be explored, but uh, the, the main treatments are methimazole, which is an oral medication that regulates the thyroid, a radioactive iodine therapy, which is actually a subcutaneous injection that deactivates the excess thyroid tissue and helps to normalize the thyroid level. And then there's a prescription diet that's iodine restricted. So I don't know how to formulate a vegan diet that would meet those parameters. But if the cat either had the medication or the radioactive iodine treatment, and that allowed for that stabilization of the thyroid, then there wouldn't be a need for a prescription diet for hyperthyroidism. Now for the kidney disease, there are various herbs and supplements that can be given to help support the kidney function that, that can be uh, good to do in addition to a diet approach. Typically, the prescription diets are lower in protein that are meat-based. So I believe that a lower protein vegan diet can still offer beneficial effects for these patients who are suffering from these things, provided that they eat the food. If they don't eat the food, then they're going to have to eat something else because if cats go without eating for long periods, that can be harmful to their health. They can develop fatty liver disease. We don't want that. Thank you for addressing that. So one little more general question is, in what ways or situations is cooked food um, versus raw food better for our animal companions? Is there a ratio of cooked to raw food that you would recommend? You know, some, some foods, um, I'll, I'll just start out the conversation. Some foods, actually, the vitamins and minerals release when cooked and some foods, they are higher when raw. Um, some foods are easier to digest when cooked. So we wanna take that into consideration for dogs. If, it's, if we're feeding raw, we wanna puree it or at least you know, dice it up really fine to break down the plant-based or cellular, you know, the, the um, fibers that are encapsulating it. Um, you know, but with my clients, I often tell people, I, obviously we wanna cook the beans and the legumes and those types of things. Those have some toxic uh, aspects to them if they're not at least sprouted and cooked. 
Um, but when it comes to vegetables, I sometimes tell them to mix, you know, do, do like a, a vary it. Some days cook them by steaming, not boiling because then the water leaches the um, nutrients, but by steaming and then other days serve them raw by pulverizing them so that you kind of get the best of both worlds. And that's, that's really how I approach it. Thank you. Um, maybe just a couple more questions. And one of them is, uh, Paula is asking, is there an issue with trying to transition two senior female cats uh, who are around 10 to a vegan, vegan diets? Um, she's looking at the wet and dry, different kinds of foods uh, that are vegan. And is there something that you could say to allay her fears um, that she's gambling with their health? I would first of all have a blood panel done just to get a baseline. If they're at that age, at 10, they are seniors. So it's a good thing to do regardless of their diet as a, a way to monitor their overall health and also provide you with a sense of confirmation that you know where they're at to start with in terms of their kidney values, liver values, protein, complete blood count, thyroid level, and then maybe over the course of even a month, gradually transition them to the vegan food because it's not familiar with them. So it takes time and patience to get them acquainted with it. And then after they transition, get them in for another blood test a few months later and include your analysis as part of that blood panel and your analysis to see if there's been any change. And if there hasn't been, and they're still maintaining a healthy weight and their coat is healthy and, and they're alert and acting normally and active, then I, you know, I would not see that as any concern as far as their age being older for when they were transitioned. I mean, we've seen people transition to vegan diets in older years and they've done very well. There are some cats who are obese. I, I've seen a number of cats who are carrying a lot of extra weight and that increases their risk for cancer. So they're holding on to a lot of toxins. So it may be actually a healthy thing if they lose a few pounds, if they needed to lose them. And the fiber rich plant-based food allows them to have satiety or fullness without the extra caloric density that the meat-based food has in it intrinsically. Also, cats who are consuming seafood diets are getting a whopping dose of mercury in their system, which could be leading to a lot of other health concerns down the road. Thank you for addressing that question, which I think many, many people who have lived with cats might be asking internally. Um, so this is going to wrap up our question, our Q&A from our attendees, and I know there's zillions of more questions. So I apologize if we're not able to answer all of them. Uh, one thing you want to know is that Northern Vegans, Carrie with Northern Vegans, has a wonderful resource list that she'll be able to send out to you. So at this point, I'm going to transition a little bit into the next part of what we're doing today, which is a little exciting as well. Um, so just be if you, um, as I mentioned before, you're able to watch this, you'll get a replay tomorrow and via Zoom and also Northern Vegans will have it posted on their YouTube channel. And you can also find it on the Northern Vegans Facebook and events pages. So now we're going to go to more resources, discounts, and free giveaways. And Carrie, who I mentioned a moment ago, Carrie Plummer, who's a founding member of Northern Vegans, she's going to put all of this giveaway information and discount codes into the chat box shortly. The giveaways are good for today only. Remember, just one person per giveaway. And to get a copy of the discounts and giveaways, please email info at northernvegans.com with the subject in capital <laughs> DOC file. So now I'm going to go over these with you so you'll have a good sense of what what exciting goodies are coming. There we go. So 
So these exciting discounts and giveaways will be two free phone consultations with Dr. Um, Amarindi May, who you've just heard from, so you know it'll be a really valuable session, and each is going to be a $50 value. Another one is two free lifetime accesses to the Plant Powered Dog Food Summit. Also another excellent value at $99 a piece. There are six $20 gift certificates to vegan pet supply online stores, discounts and coupons to vegan pet food companies that are exclusive to all participants, and seven free yoga classes with Dr. Susan Craig on Zoom, another exclusive offer, which are really exciting. So I'm going to go through some of these discounts at first. So Wild Earth has offered a discount, 50% off of the first dog food subscription, not the treats, <laughs> for first time customers only. And there's special landing page for this deal, which is posted, and you can get that again on the chat box, or you can use the code Northern Vegans 50. The coupon code is good until the end of the year, so we don't have an exact date. Please take advantage of this sooner rather than later. The V-Dog discount, 15% off the entire order for first time customers only. The coupon code is Northern Vegans 15. This coupon code is good between April 17th, 2021 through May 31st, 2021. Evolution Diet also has a discount for both vegan dog and cat food. They offer 15% by phone in discounts to all first time buyers. You can give them a call at 651-228-0632. The owner, Eric Weissman, also offers free consultations. You can find more info at their website. Exclusive to all participants to receive your free trio sample pack from Mikado in Canada, which is good for either dogs or cats, you will need to complete a quick assessment. And there's a link available in the chat and also in the doc file. Towards the end of the assessment, participants can select a free sample by adding a little tick mark in the checkbox. Those in the US or UK will need to pay a shipping fee. <laughs> and shipping is free in Canada. Exclusive to all participants, another special exclusive is Dr. Susan Craig teaches a classical yoga class, Dharma Yoga, for beginner and intermediate levels every Sunday at 11 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. PST, Pacific Time, on Zoom. These classes will be free through the end of May, a total of seven classes. Please contact Dr. Craig to sign up. Sounds really great. <laughs> you can go to drsusancraig.com. She's also on Facebook, Instagram, and email as well. So now on to the free giveaways. When you're communicating with Northern Vegans, please use all caps in the subject line for the emails. There are two free 20 minute phone consultations, each a $50 value with Dr. May are available for the very first two people who respond via email. So the email address is info at northernvegans.com with the subject line in caps, Dr. May phone consultation. Please include your first and last name and phone number in the email. Send the email today. It's only good for April 17th for this free giveaway for the very first two emails that are received. Two free plant-powered dog food summits. This is a $100 value for each summit, plus a lifetime access to over 12 hours of videos from experts in the field of vegan dog nutrition. The very first two people who respond via email to info at northernvegans.com with the subject dog food summit will be the lucky winners. Include your first and last name and phone number in the email and send the email again today only, April 17th, for this free giveaway and to the very first two emails that are received. Five $20 Compassion Circle gift certificates. So Compassion Circle is an all vegan company that offers plant-based supplements for our companion animals and other great resources. The first five people who respond via email to info at northernvegans.com with the subject compassion circle 20 gift will win. 
Include your first and last name and phone number. Again, this is offered for today only for the first five emails received. One $20 Eco Dogs and Cats gift certificate. And this company is an all vegan company that offers vegan pet supplies. The very first person who responds via email, again, to info at northernvegans.com with the subject Eco Dogs and Cats 20 gift will win. Include your first and last name and phone number in the email. Please be sure to email today because it's only good for today for the very first email received. Thank you for sitting through the discounts and giveaways and also hopefully some of you are typing away <laughs> getting ready to get some of these fabulous gifts. Be sure to send an email with the subject line doc file to info at northernvegans.com. Then you'll have everything that we just went over and it'll be easy to access and all the live links will be there. Yay. <laughs> so it's really such a pleasure to have this opportunity to learn from one another, another to gather together and really dig in deep to some of these questions about vegan dog and cat food with experts. So I want to take a moment to really thank uh, all of the panelists who have joined us today with their expertise. Um, also to Marlene, who shared her expertise in answering the questions and navigating the, the interview. Um, and Thank you to all of you for joining us. It's your questions as well for the Q&A that really spiced it up quite a bit. And thank you to Northern Vegans, our host, for this very helpful webinar. So I hope that it's been an interesting hour or so for all of you. And just want to let you know you will have access again to the replay and to watching this on YouTube forevermore. And I Thank you to everyone and to Northern Vegans. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks. Have a good day. You too.